Hey, everybody. Welcome to Ellensburg, Washington, USA, on a Tuesday afternoon here in late April of 2021. I'm so glad that you're joining us today live, the local time. 12.46, I don't know, 12.47, somewhere in there, uh, p.m., and we will begin our program, Olympic Peninsula Part 1, at the top of the hour. That's a little bit more than 10 minutes from now. Hey, Matthew. You get you snooped it out. boy. Good. Um, so, you know the drill by now. We begin our program at the top of the hour, but we start uh, a little bit early so that I can uh, say hi to the live viewers and make sure that we're doing okay with our setup. I do have a, a new laptop that just arrived, and uh, I'm not ready to use it yet. I'm chicken, but uh, I'll eventually figure out how to use it. Rylin is here and Bryce. Uh, so let's say hi to a few folks, see where everybody's viewing from, and uh, we'll make sure we're feeling comfortable. And uh, away we will go at the top of the hour. Lake City says it's five by five. Looking visually sharp, says Letha Lee. Thank you. Ridgefield, Washington. San Diego, California. Hello, Oscar. Billings, Montana. Kankakee, Illinois. Auckland, New Zealand. Hello, Mar Martin. Moneta, Virginia. Bergen, Norway. Christchurch, New Zealand. Got a couple of Kiwis in the house. Stefano's from Italy. Hello. Vancouver, Washington. Lapine, Oregon. Port Angeles, Washington. Talking about your turf today. Uh, the Netherlands. Portugal. Hello, Jao. Cologne, Germany, that's Geneva, Prosser, Washington, Melbourne, Australia, Finland. Uh, we already got a bunch of folks. Oh, Princess is here. Glasgow, Scotland, Sierra Foothills, Bangor, Maine, uh, Anacortes, Washington, Rotterdam, the Netherlands, Melbourne, Florida. We got two Melbournes on opposite sides of the planet. Warsaw, Poland, hello, Powell. Yeah, man. Sweden, hello. Aberdeen, Scotland. Somebody saying hello to Patrick. Patrick, are you here? Odensee, Denmark. Uh, Zigged, Hungary, greets you. Hello, Adam. I greet you back. Port Chalmers, New Zealand, baby. What's going on with you Kiwis today? Great. Glad that you're here. Uh, Thomas is from uh, Germany and France and Switzerland. What up, homie? How tell Papa? 100. Sun Valley, Idaho. There's Mary. She's here. Carrollton, Texas. God, I hope Andrew doesn't show up because we, we got a gift. Got another gift for everybody. Andrew was joking in the field like Andrew's watching half of the... Andrew, are you there? Andrew's over in Leavenworth and he doesn't make the trip uh, twice a week from Leavenworth to attend. And Andrew says, every time I'm not there, you do you you share a gift to the students. What's up? It's like, well, you connect the dots, man. You're not here, and I got gifts. Uh, hello, Norley. Oh, uh, don't tease me like that now. Come on, Marcel. She is a role model for many of us in many ways. Pasadena, California, Calgary, Alberta. Okay, well, it looks like we're doing great, huh? That's good. That's good. Um, we did spend Friday uh, in the Wenatchee area up above Wenatchee. That's a video that was posted over the weekend called uh, Saddle Rock Two Bears. Randy Lewis, a uh, friend of mine, joined us. Hayden, hello. Uh, so if you didn't see that field video, you might enjoy it. Uh, I'm getting more and more bold about showing students' faces. Whatever. Bryce. Bryce is grinning through his mask right now. Yes, you are. I can tell. Your eyes are crinkling, Bryce. Don't give me that. I know when you're grinning, Bryce. Come on, Bryce. So anyway, we'll, we'll continue that pattern. We're going out again tomorrow uh, with the group. Uh, Weather was subpar this weekend, but it looks like the wind will calm down tomorrow. So looking forward to getting out again with these guys. We'll see how many we can get. We got good energy in the room. 
I don't know really what's happening today. I have a loose plan, but we'll see how it goes. Uh, I'm going to wait for one more person to show up before I share my gift. Do I have anything else? You guys hungry? Matthew, you hungry? How's your palate? Is it refined? Mine neither. Are you tater tater? Bryce is interested now. I got some very fancy edibles for you. From Weed, California. 420. But uh, I got in trouble passing out cigars, so I'm definitely not going to pass out that. But I, I've got, I've got, I got a gift. Did you enjoy that cigar, Tim? You had it this weekend? Any particular reason? Oh, yeah. How'd that go? Oh. Hey. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Nice. You guys all camped out there? Yeah. Sweet. Who from our group was in there? Hayden and uh, Tim and, and Bryce and Emma went last weekend. We're talking. Sweet. Good. Oh, Ash is here. Okay. So I, I, I'm running out of time. I got to set up this gift. So um, so officially, I'm not supposed to be accepting gifts. <laughs> officially. Uh, but many of you are big hearted and uh, you want to, uh, uh, I don't know, you just want to be part of the group and you want to, uh, and I'm just the middleman. So I don't know. I feel like it's harmless enough. I hope it is. So anyway, this arrived from Weed, California, a kind of a very fancy kind of refrigerated box, dry ice kind of a deal. And this is from Janet. So Janet, you are uh, amazing. So thank you for ordering uh, three of these kind of refrigerated things. Uh, packets uh, were in the big styrofoam box. And I, once I realized what they were, I immediately put them in the refrigerator over the weekend. And so inside of uh, these, there's three of these inside of this. I'm from Wisconsin. You know, I was growing I, you know, tater tot casseroles. My uh, about my palate, but th this is very, very fancy chocolate. And I turned on the autofocus for the first time. It'll be an experiment today to see how distracting the autofocus is as it's hunting for the focus. But I feel like I want to show some of these things. So this episode of Nick from the Classroom brought to you by. Pyroclastic Artisan Chocolates from Weed, California. Becca is the owner. Becca, are you a geology? Are you a geologist? And you you dabble in uh, fancy chocolates, but here's what these chocolates look like. And there's three of these very expensive packets. I'm reading now. This is a 12-piece assortment, Mexican chocolate, dark mocha, raspberry, pomegranate rose, dark orange, lemon lavender, and cafe au lait. Pyroclastic chocolates. Well, Janet, thank you for making this happen. Oh, we got almost everybody here. Now they can smell the chocolate, I think. So all Rachel's excited. So I, I brought a knife. All right. I got handouts for you in the back. I'm also going to bring chocolates to you in the back. Come on. Come on now. Come on now. Thank you again very much, Janet. These guys will really appreciate uh, eating, noshing while they learn. You just ate. Well, you got room for dessert. You have good hearing. Damn. Well, it's, it's, I can't get away with shit around here. Oh, that's right. Uh, who are you dating, by the way? Micah. Still? Yeah. yeah. I'm talking about him today. I wanted are to make you? I wanted to make sure. I'm yeah. out of here then. Oh God. You just said you <laughs> were dating. Oh my god, are those like a... You better oh, read like the label. This is this is this is artisan chocolate. That's so cool. How can, I'll put one here so they're in arm's reach. Janet from Weed, California now. You cool. gotta be you gotta be grateful to Janet. She can hear you right now. Super cool. Thank you, Janet. That's it. Is there weed? That's here? it. There's no weed. It's just from Weed, California. Yeah, yeah, uh, I'll bring it to you in a sec. 
Yeah, Ariel. I like chocolate, especially when it comes to like dark chocolates and stuff like that. I gotta have one here. Look at that! Isn't that amazing? I guess I'll take this one. You look like cut gems. That's really cool. Yeah. Oh, Tim's taking pictures. Oh boy, we got, we got, uh, we got. Oh, I wish you could see these guys. They are all like studying. So they're like studying a, for a minerals exam or something. But it's chalk. Tim, here you go. No. Go, buddy. Sweet. Thank you. Sure. Have you made a decision? I'm gonna. I'm hoping I'm, this is the lemon. Yeah, which one did you grab? I don't know. What do you think? Did you read the road now? I think that's the... Uh, there's like five flavors. Mexican chocolate. Is that the Mexican chocolate? I bet that's raspberry. Milk and raspberry, maybe? Oh, my God. It's not Oh, my God. Pardon? Bryce says thank you to that person. That's Janet now. Janet and Weed. Bryce, uh, Bryce would like to thank Janet. Thank you, Janet. I'm just nibbling on the corners here. They're all taking pictures of their chocolates. They're looking at the labels. They're trying to make a good decision. Might have been a mistake. Now we're not going to be able to focus on the topic. Oh, this is the orange one. What, what's it? What's in the orange? Doesn't one of them have orange in it, Matthew? Yeah. Um, not this Thursday, but next Thursday. Yeah. I may be missing. Um, one of my buddies is graduating. In oh the yeah. Program in Salt Lake City and not a boy. No, it's a good timing. That's right after the midterm. That's a good. That's Perfect. a good Just thing. Let you know. Thank you, sir. Yeah, no, we're good. We're good. Thanks. Thank you. Who's got a flavor they can report on quick? I got orange. Who's got a flavor? Have you figured out what? Is it gone? Bryce, you ate it already? Raspberry. Raspberry's good, Luke. It's like triclinic or something. I was like, what's the, what's the? Okay, so the lemon one is really good. The lemon one. You, it's okay. It's a, you can you can you didn't make a mistake. It's all right. Just the lemon one's the best. That's all. Oh my god, that's amazing. I don't deserve chocolate like this, Janet. Thank you. These were also in the box. Oh, there's a whoo! There's a little, there's a little kick. Oh boy, I'm from Wisconsin. I don't think my dad ever had Mexican food in his whole life. He's like, well. I Sorry, Patrick. You gotta love it. Collect them all. <coughs> I mean, whoo. Yeah. Well, maybe they're all hot. Do they all have a little kick to them? I got the hot one, huh? Okay. Okay, youngins, we're about to begin. Make sure you have the handouts for the day. They're in the back corner. Um, you have a little chocolate as well. Ryan just came in. He can grab a little chocolate, but so we're getting the handouts. We're jotting down the outline. We are committing uh, mentally and physically here. I don't know how today will go, but I have some plans at least. So what the heck? Uh, it's one o'clock. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you for being here. Let's do some programming notes before we get started completely. Um, how am I going to see tomorrow? We're going to be in the field tomorrow morning. Who's joining us? Uh-oh. Oh, no. We still have quite a few. You're distracted. Okay. You know the time and the place. Uh, the apple trees are in blossom. Wenatchee River Valley. We'll be back over there again, but it, it's an outstanding place this time of year, and we'll be uh, at a new location, of course. 
look forward to be with you then. So um, see you tomorrow morning, most of you. That's great. Thursday is Olympic Peninsula Part 2. Friday is your homework due on Karen Sigloch. Uh, I've only gotten one so far from Ash. Gold star, nice job. Hayden, I expect to see an email from you. So that's Friday. And then before it feels like you're just getting too much here, we got to do our midterm. So that's a week from today. And I sent you that email a couple nights ago, and I that's a pretty much all I want to say. I, I, I don't haven't written it yet, but that's hopefully enough guidance to give you a sense of, of what I'm expecting from you uh, for that exam. Okay? So most of us are now settling down and locking in, and we're good. I, is that the MA questions about this week or early next? We doing okay? Okay. Um, last week was kind of wild, huh? Ocean plates, and... I think the wildness in part is due to the fact that the science has not been settled yet. We still don't know for sure which plates were where at a particular time. And that's what I want to start with today. I want to go back to these tectonic models and not do the whole thing again, but I do feel like I want to, I don't know, focus us just a little bit, basically synthesize in the first 10 minutes. We'll see how that goes. But the first 10 minutes, I'm hoping to just kind of take the greatest hits from the last couple of meetings, because we're going to come back to it. We are going to come back to it. Mike Eddy, who's the featured performer for us today and Thursday uh, and beyond, uh, has some very significant uh, in interest in this topic uh, about this 60 to 40 million year time window and what's going on tectonically. But I, my main message to start with is I want us to kind of bring it down a little bit. I, I want to scale us down. I want us to get back to Washington. I want us to look very carefully at some data that the Mike Eddy paper is presenting to us. Because if we're up here just waving our arms and doing, oh, well, maybe this ocean plate was here and this subduction zone was here, we're going to lose it. I'm talking about myself, too. We're just going to lose it. It's, it's too much competing stuff at all at the same time in our mind. Was it Re at last time came up after and said she was, what was your phrase? I can't remember. You were just frustrated or like, what was it? Mildly infuriated. Perfectly said. Yes. So we want to, and, and every, and Tim's already nodding the head. You got, you stretch out that neck now, Tim. You're, you're an excellent head nodder. I don't want you to go crazy now. So I do want us to kind of change our tack this week. And knowing that we will go back and we will broaden back out and revisit some of these topics. Okay, that's enough time for you to jot this down. I got more chalkboard stuff than normal today. I've, I'm preloaded and ready for action. Just seeing how we go here. But I think I want to start with my attempt to synthesize some of the main parts. And I think I'm going to get you involved right off the bat. This is unscripted, not what you were planning on contributing uh, for the class, but I think we can do it. Um, I'll get you started. Uh, these are near trench magmas, NTMs, and we were talking about them especially last time, Thursday that was. You remember with the Spencer Houston, the Spencer Houston from Houston talk about the resurrection plate. And we decided that these near trench magmas up here, you tell me, why did we care about those near trench magmas? What, what's the main plate tectonic message of a near trench magma? Ryan. Correct. We have a triple junction at the coast of the continent where we have near trench magmas. Triple junction. Put my finger on the map. And as Ryan just said, evidence of a triple junction where we have a spreading center out in the water subducting into a trench. And the near trench magmas are good geologic evidence for that. Thank you. Really improvising right off the top. How many spreading ridges did Spencer Houston from Houston demand? One or two? Two. He wanted two because he says, look, there's near trench magmas up in Alaska. There's also near trench magmas down in the Pacific Northwest, meaning Vancouver Island and also Western Washington. By the way, I have made some progress since I saw you last. I actually figured out where the near-trench magmas are in our state. Didn't know it till this morning. 
Got it on the chalkboard, ready to go. That's coming in a second. And you might, I know some of the people at home were like, I don't get how this even works. Like, this is the resurrection plate, but like, is it, a, is it even moving? Well, there's plate vectors that are, are difficult. And so I'm just spitballing the orientation of these ridges at a particular time. Therefore, I'm spitballing the orientation or the plate vector of the resurrection plate itself. Let's not get hung up. Hung up. Calm down, boy. Calm down. Let's not get hung up on the plate vectors. Instead, the main message was, my God, I think we got two subducting spreading ridges. This was last time. Still trying to synthesize. What's Baja BC? That's a movement intellectually, academically, and physically of crust that was moving almost 2,000 miles to the north between 85 and 55 million years ago. Now, why did I have to throw that into our discussion? We got enough fish to fry up here. Why am I talking about that crazy idea? Here's the reason. If you're a Baja BC person, you do not believe the resurrection plate ever existed. Even though Spencer gave us the tomography data and the thermal erosion of much of the resurrection plate. Now we just have a little bit of that plate left called the Yukon slab, if you recall. If you're a Baja BC person, you say, you can do all this near-trench magma generation with one spreading ridge. So let's do it. I'm still trying to just synthesize the greatest hits from last week, hoping this is feeling okay. So... If we just have one instead of two spreading ridges, I'm talking about the other tentative model right now. We don't have the resurrection plate. This is all during the window of 60 to 40 million years. I have most of you. We're reviewing. Does it feel like it? We're reviewing. I hope it feels like it. And the idea is that the triple junction where the underwater spreading ridge is subducting beneath North America has been migrating north through time. Just coming back to you now. And Baja BC people say, we can get 2,000 miles of movement north of Mount Stewart, of the Swakane Biotite Nice, of the Skagit Nice, of a bunch of local bedrock units here in Washington. We can get that from Southern California or Northern Mexico all the way up here to Central Washington if we have a spreading ridge way down south. And therefore, we have a northward migrating oceanic plate. I wasn't planning on showing you this, but I will. This is from Will Matthews, University of Calgary. All I want you to notice is that he has a migrating spreading ridge. And you can't read the, geog the, the geography here, but he's down in California at these dates. And he's eventually migrating this triple junction north as we continue to have the Kula plate heading to the north. I'm trying not to complicate matters. I'm trying to synthesize the best I can. So if you are a single spreading ridge person, how do you explain these near trench magmas up here? Did anybody catch it from last time? Anybody feeling gutsy? This is off script. Somebody want to try it? Here's the question again. There are near-trench magmas that run from 63 to 47 million years ago. How in the world are you going to get near-trench magmas up there if we don't have a second spreading ridge subducting beneath Alaska? Anybody? Uh-oh. Why not, Ryan? You, you're remembering correctly that each of these near-trench magmas was created at a triple junction, but with this model, we're saying this triple junction is still down, way down here. So therefore, we're moving this crust and we're shooting it full of bullets. I showed you this last time. I'll show it to you again. 
There's the Sanak Baranoff Island uh, near trench magma ocean, sorry, age progression of the near trench magmas. I promise I'm almost done with this. I don't remember where I got this. I'm just going to hold it steady the best I can, try to get it in focus for both of you guys. Not really working, is it, for you guys? I'm not holding it steady enough. Got to get that second camera. My bad. I hope you can make out the sense that the yellow line is the spreading ridge underwater. But this green bean, Sanok down to Baranoff, is being drifted north. And again, you're shooting it with a bullet each time you have a portion of the green bean on top of the relatively stationary spreading ridge. I'm almost done. So you're keeping track? Near trench magma spreading ridge. Well, this was last time. If we subduct a spreading ridge, we're going to get a slab window in a third dimension that widens as you go deeper, correct? And therefore, hot mantle coming to the surface. What's the petrology at the surface? that is getting developed above a subducting or a... What kind of igneous rocks are you forming at the surface above a slab window? Adakites, among other things. Adakites, our friends from last time. Last week, really. And then, oh yeah, there was a hot spot. <laughs> So I'm pausing because all of these things are thrown into the mix and I'm getting frustrated. I can't keep it all straight in my head. I can't do it. And we have multiple parties contributing new papers and some are in one camp and others are in another camp. It's very difficult to organize all that. That's why we are changing our focus at least the rest of today and possibly Thursday as well. Good. The energy is wonderful. Right now, let's keep it. And I can feel the energy because you know it's about to come. You. You're about to be on stage. You've got your top five list ready to go from Mike Eddy's paper in 2017, but Matthew wants to say something quick. Uh, just a real quick question. Yeah. Would we expect to see the same paleomagnetic signature um, or around the same as the basalt or the near trench magma up in Alaska um, as the ones down in Washington? You mean in the magma, in the near trench magmas themselves, have we looked at the paleo mag of that stuff? Wow, interesting thought. I don't know. I don't think so. Because wouldn't you expect to see them formed around the same latitude if, if, if it's moving forward, moving now? Matt, I'm, no, I'm shaking my head in, in, uh, in bewilderment. That's a great question. Now, Daryl Cowan is a big fan of this. University of Washington he be, may be watching right now. Daryl, have, have we done paleomeg on those near-trench magmas? I'm not sure we have. And if we haven't, why haven't we? But he's from the Baja BC community. Wow. Yeah, I'm, I may be just missing something right now, but I, I'm not shaking my head no. I'm shaking my head yes. Great job. Great job, Matthew. Nice job. Okay. Now here's the part where I don't know where we're going to go. But you each have your top five list of things that you want to contribute to the course from this paper right now. Home viewers, I hope the, the newly engaged autofocus for your camera is working properly. But this is a joint effort between Mike Eddy who's at Purdue University, Ken Clark, former student here at CWU, I might add, who's now at University of Puget Sound, and Mike Polins from the Washington Geological Survey. I think let's just do what we've done before. Let's just open it up. Let's do rapid fire, and then it's my job to build a narrative off of that. Let's go. Let's fill the air. Who wants to get us started? You read the paper. Let's go. Andrew will get us started. Andrew, no chocolate for you. Sorry. It's all it's probably all gone already. 
Go ahead. The figure two shows for us all separating Blue Mountain units from the traffic formation. Yes. All three transects. Thank you. Nice observation, Andrew. So you have handouts today, uh, two of which are from today's paper. So for the home audience, Home audience, you know how to get to these papers. Upper right-hand corner of nicksentner.com, 351. Click on it. You'll get to these papers. So uh, I'm going to hold off on Andrews for just a second. But we have this beautiful map of the Olympic Peninsula, right? Strait of Juan de Fuca. Here's British Columbia up here in the southern tip of Vancouver Island. This is a familiar map to us because you've already had this. Sorry. You've already had this. This is Oh shit. Here. Sorry, Patrick. This guy, Mike, you've got this one. By the way, before I forget, we know that this is the the magnitude of Celestia as it exists today. Northern California, Western Oregon, Washington, heading up to the southernmost tip of Vancouver Island. What the hell's going on here? There's the Olympic Peninsula. There's this huge horseshoe. Hold off. Tim wants to answer, but I don't want to do that yet. But that's obviously this huge indent. Like, why? Maybe by the end of today, we'll, we'll address it. But... Um, Andrew is contributing, Andrew from Leavenworth is contributing that we have a major thrust fault in the cross section. And those that are less well versed, you haven't taken, um, well, this is a cross section line right here between A and A prime. So there's an invisible line going right east west across the Olympic Peninsula map. And then here's that same A to A prime in cross section. And you can hopefully see an agreement between these two images. And there is a thrust fault. Yes, there's a thrust fault. And Andrew's noticing in all three transects. So these black lines here, Dungeness transect, et cetera, we're, going, we're digging a hole, basically, intellectually. And we're finding a major thrust fault that's giving us a surprising geometry in the subsurface of the Olympic Peninsula. More. Thank you for that, Andrew, who's not here. Megan. So I don't know if this is close to what Steve was talking about. Yep. I read that the Blue Mountain is a lot younger and was thrust underneath the crescent formation. It's related, but it's the main point of the paper. And in the outline, I wrote Blue Mountain Unit, question, solution. Let's expand on that, Megan. Um, and I see more hands up, so you want to talk about the Blue Mountain Unit. It's not even in the title of the paper, but to me, it's, it's the main piece of the paper. Uh, let's spitball off of Megan. What, what, um, why is the Blue Mountain unit important in understanding the building of the Olympic Peninsula? Uh, Logan. Um, it kind of talks about the accretion of Celestia. Yeah. It didn't really sit that easily. It kind of jammed it. Yeah. Um, and when it jammed it, it created that four arc basin. And that's where all those uh, Blue Mountain units uh, sediment. That's true. The Blue Mountain units are, are uh, um, actually, I don't want to do exactly what you're doing right now. Thank you, though, for that. Isn't this nice? I'm asking for comments, and then I'm, like, shutting everybody down. I'm trying to frame it just in real time with you. Does somebody else see what I just asked? What was the old view? What was the old view of the Blue Mountain unit with respect to building Celestia, and what's the new... Uh, result that uh, Mike was able to, to come up with. What's the old idea, Rachel? Well, wasn't it thought that Celestia, based off of um, the Blue Mountain unit, that Celestia was um, built off the continental part of itself or something like that? Yes, although I want to rephrase just a touch. I'll just do it verbally. No, I won't. The Blue Mountain unit... Let's, let's keep with the map here. I'm all over the place because I'm trying to find the, the best way to make this pay for us in, in the short term. I think I have a plan in the last 30 seconds. Let's see if it works. 
Uh, I'm going to steer you just a little bit. Geologic map, correct. Um, where's the Blue Mountain unit on this thing? What color? Let's not overthink it. It's a blue, it's a purpley blue, right? It's this thin guy right here. BMU, that's the Blue Mountain unit. It comes right around this horseshoe. What does it look like in cross section? Can barely see it, man. Are we really saying this is the main part of the paper? It's this dinky little, almost vertical, maybe is vertical in places, blue unit. Uh, play with me. What kind of rock in the Blue Mountain unit? Um, it is called a turbidite. Let's go to the third page of Mike's paper. What plain language word does he use for the Blue Mountain unit? He's collecting samples and getting ages. What, what kind of rock? Page 655, if you must know. He's got a table. Bottom of 655, which is probably like the fourth page. It's sandstone, man, yeah. So the Blue Mountain unit. That focuses. Yeah, there we go. Still not working great. There, I'm not flipping you off. There's four sandstones that he collected out of the Blue Mountain unit. So this is a surprise, I think, isn't it? First of all, here's this very tiny layer of sandstone making up a very small portion of the Olympic Peninsula, and yet it is the focal point of at least the first half of this paper by Mike Eddy. He's calling it a turbidite. Now tell me what a turbidite is. You form a turbidite on a continental slope, meaning you're offshore, meaning you are away from the beach, you're getting into some shallow water off the coast of North America, and you have these events where you have these underwater landslides, this sand being flushed down a submarine canyon quite often. It's a sandstone, but there's a very specific depositional environment. It's not a river sand, it's not a beach sand, it's an underwater landslide sand. I'm not sure that matters to us a whole lot, at least to start with. I'm still back to the question. So uh, Rachel kind of got to it, but have somebody else help us kind of zero in on the question. That Those blue mountain sandstones, previous to Mike Eddy's work, were viewed how? Why not, Tim? I'll go. Somebody else want to add? I'll, I'll go. Uh, Matthew? Were, were those blue mountains seen to underlie Celestia, showing that Celestia happened at the continental margin? Yes. Believing that Celestia might have happened at the continental margin? Matthew, what did you have for breakfast today? <laughs> what the hell's going on here? You've been pretty quiet the whole quarter. You, you're like two for two with like home runs right now. Oh, this paper just resonated with you. I think Mike may be watching us here. Mike, Matthew, silent Matthew is on fire at the moment. I got to introduce you guys. Damn, son. It was clear that the Blue Mountain unit was beneath much of Seletia. Even though everything's vertical now, it was beneath the rest of this Seletia or crescent basalt. And so the old idea was... Basically this, I'll paraphrase, conversations that I imagine over the last 15 years, talking to Ray Wells, you remember him? Ray, I just read your paper, it says Seletsi was an oceanic plateau. I don't think I believe that because there's a continental derived sandstone at the base. So let's see, it had to have formed at the edge of North America or on the edge of North America. That's what you said. That's what you said. That's what she said. <laughs> and so Mike tried to solve the problem. 
By doing what? What did he do with that Blue Mountain sandstone to get at the problem? The problem is, these guys are saying, I don't think Seletia was an oceanic plateau. I don't think it was made out in the water because it's sitting on a bunch of sandstone. What did Mike do to prove that it really was an oceanic plateau that was built out in the water? Ash. They got dates on it. That's what Mike Eddy does. Let me tell you a little bit about him. Beautifully done. Beautifully done. Uh, Mike Eddy is not much older than you are. Uh, I think he's in his early 30s. And you're like, well, that's a lot older than me. Well, you know, compared to me, you know, he's closer to your age than my age. He just started as an assistant professor at Purdue University. Have you heard of Purdue? It's a, it's a university in the Big Ten in uh, West Lafayette, Indiana. And he's finishing his second year there. And he's building this high-precision geochronology lab. I mean, we've got some of that instrumentation upstairs, I hear. I still don't really know what the hell's going on up there. But Angela's got all sorts of instruments up there. But this guy, Mike Eddy, is like one of the biggest shooting stars that we have in the world of North American geology. Even though he's young, he's cranked out these amazing papers. And I have to say it, he's from the East Coast. He goes to Princeton. He learns all this uranium lead zircon geochronology from one of Sam Bowering's students. Then he goes and studies under Sam Bowering, who's a huge name in geochronology work at Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Then he does a postdoc back at Princeton. This guy could work anywhere in the world. And where does he work? Frickin' Wenatchee and Leavenworth and Dryden and, and uh, the Olympic Peninsula. It's amazing that he has chosen this area and these topics for his work at, last, at least in the next few years and really the last five to seven years as a graduate student. So this is the first of a number of, of papers by Michael Eddy. And if you have a great memory, you remember our first day. And I said that I'm associated with this guy, Mike Eddy, because he's got a brand new grant to work in the North Cascades. And I'm going to be hooking up with him up in the mountains for the next five years. And I need to know what, what's going on with him, what his work is, what his, his stances are on triple junction Migration, for instance, by the way, he doesn't believe. He disagrees with everybody about the direction that this triple junction migrates, but we'll get to that in this class. So I don't mean to go on and on about Mike Eddy, but I'm, I'm putting that in here so that you have a sense that it's not only just me being interested in his work. And yes, Ash, he comes up with these crazy dates. Remember we did that a while back. Jennifer Kasbaum, our first paper, same world. Princeton, same advisor. They come up with these laughably precise dates on these zircons, which we'll get to in just a second. So yes, his main contribution is, yeah, I, okay, I can use my lab and my techniques and I can come in and get a way more, he doesn't say it this way, I can get a way more precise date than exists before. And I can prove that Seletia was built offshore in the water as an oceanic plateau. That's the main thrust of the paper. It's in the abstract. It's in the conclusion. And it was not built at the continental margin. What's the evidence? He's got good dates now on the sandstones of the Blue Mountain unit. And as was said just a second ago, there's great evidence that the Blue Mountain unit was thrust underneath, was shoved underneath Seletia. In other words, he determined that the Blue Mountain unit was younger than Seletia, not older than Seletia, even though it's sitting beneath Seletia. I repeat, that's the, big me that's the only message of today. The only one? The only big one. If you didn't get to the main message, here it is one more time, verbally. The new dates from Mike Eddy for the Blue Mountain Unit sandstones, a.k.a. turbidites, are younger than the Seletia basalts, even though they, are, they look like they are stratigraphically below the Seletia basalts. 
How's it possible to get something young underneath something old? You freaking shove it in there. Pausing, letting it simmer. Something just happened. Most of you got it. Let's go to the dates. He's got dates from the Blue Mountain unit we didn't have before. Is there a Blue Mountain, by the way? I had to Google it this morning. There is. So if you heard of Hurricane Ridge, Hurricane Ridge is a very popular place to visit. You go to Port Angeles, Washington. You take the road south of Port Angeles, right out of town. You just go up, 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 up. You're, you're climbing to the top of Hurricane Ridge. There's a big visitor center. It's a national park, Olympic National Park. So there is a Blue Mountain, which is the next ridge or the next little peak to the, to the east of that Hurricane Ridge Visitor Center. So that's Blue Mountain proper. But as probably all have, we've got new high precision dates with laughably tiny error bars between 47 and 44. And we know that's a younger date than the building of Silesia, which was what? 56 to 48, correct? And yet these sandstones sit underneath Silesia. If you're having a hard time having it sit underneath so let's see, let's go back to this one more time. So I know things are difficult because we have these vertical layers. How do I want to do this? Um, yeah, I don't want to do that. I want to do this instead. Um, where is Siletsia on this map? This is the Olympic Peninsula. Is the entire peninsula Siletsia? Hell no. So then which actual layers or what letters are stamped into the layers or what colors, I'll give you your choice, is actual Siletsia material on this colorful map here? Pink and red. What's the pink? The letters in the pink are the light pink. I'm looking at the LC and the UC. Can someone translate, please? What's LC? Lower Crescent. What's Crescent? Frickin' Celestia, man. There it is. Like, you know some of these towns. You know some of the Hood Canal? Oh, sure, man. Bremerton? Port Angeles? Victoria? So in case you didn't get there, LC is the lower crescent. UC is the upper crescent. What's the difference? It's all Silesia basalt. How does he describe the difference? Something we haven't heard from yet. Or Logan, go ahead. Uh, didn't some form uh, with the red resin plate and some form along the cooler plate? Mm, let's back away from the plates. I don't think so. Thank you, though. What's he actually describing for us here in the, 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 the two lavender color differences? Re? That's exactly right. Beautifully done, Re. Rhiannon. Subaerial means erupting into air. Remember, we, we made the case, right? So let's see, is the oceanic plateau that builds off the floor of the Pacific Ocean. Probably on a spreading ridge, but let's not get hung up on it. The submarine part, the lower crescent, is building in the water. The pillows tell us that we're underwater, completely submarine. Who can think on their feet? That starts 56 million years ago. And did we have a rough date for when Siletsia built high enough to get its neck out of the ocean? I know it's not super handy. I can't remember, actually. Like 51-ish, something like that? I maybe said something like that. 51. That's about the time we're accreting Siletsia, by the way, if that, if that rings a bell. I think I even openly asked when I was saying that, like, are we emerging from the ocean because we're adding the thing? 
Still not really sure about that. But my point is, we go from lower crescent, which is the underwater Celestia lavas. How do we know they're underwater, offshore? Because they have pillows in them. To the UC, the upper crescent, which is a portion of the Celestia that does not have pillows. In fact, it has all sorts of indicators that it's an island. Big columns, if you remember. Other things as well. And there they are vertically. So I can't hold it. I got to go. I want it to stay with data, and I think I really still do. But I, I, I got to flip the thing over. By the way, you're, you're a staple by mistake. I didn't mean to staple those two together. So you, you can rip them apart if you want. Let's not get hung up on the triple junction reconstructions, etc. I simply want to, uh, is it worth it? No, it's not, well, no, it's not worth it, sorry. Live and unrehearsed, Nick Zedner, Geology 351. You gotta love it. What a clown. Um, more from the paper. It can stay with the data or it can really be anything else that you prepared and wanted to share with us. I'm loving the energy today, Rhiannon. Heavily vegetated area, outcrops very difficult to find. Uh, tracing thrust faults are very difficult. There were quite a few thrust faults on that map. Uh, I got to be honest, I didn't understand the significance of most of them. The, the, the lower Elwha fault, the Leech River fault, I know that's a big name. I do know the significance of that. But the, 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 the map thrust faults are difficult to follow uh, around the horseshoe. Maybe I'll make sure we finish and talk about the horseshoe. I, I, I shouldn't let that hang. Thank you, Ree. Others? Ryan? Uh, I don't know how Yeah, man. Let, let, any, I'll take anything at this point. The, Ryan's jumping to the second half of the paper, I assume, where there's a discussion of the role of the spreading ridge with Celestia. So we're kind of back to that. And Ryan, you know, was like, I'm not sure you want to go here. He's like, yeah, I'll take it. Mike is pointing out that not all the Celestia basalt is the same age, and there appears to be a younging of the Celestia in the middle of the large igneous province versus the outside, indicating evidence for a spreading ridge. Um, that triggers two things that I, I know that I wanted to do with you today. One is the other handout. Yeah, let's do it. You don't have this paper yet, but I wanted to give this to you now. This is also from Mike. Mike, Mike are you with us? You are a bold color guy. Look at these colors, man. He's like, I'm not doing pastels. I'm going bold. So different color scheme, same guy, different color scheme. It's like a, a year earlier. So the, the colors are maybe confusing to you, but we can see the horseshoe, can't we? So I'll just give you your bearings for a second. We're looking at this one. You know which one we're looking at. And I hope you can see where we're headed in May. We're heading here. We're heading home. We're heading to us. We're heading to all these field sites we've been going to every week, including next, tomorrow. So, I mean, he's worked... As I said, with the chump stick and the swalk and the, the Tiana way, and that's our target for sure. But I'm including this now because there are some gold stars. Anybody think on their feet? What, what do the gold stars mean on this map? I think I included the legend, did I not? What do the stars mean? Somebody I haven't heard from yet. You can just read it. Eight of kites. You say something else next to the gold star? I think he does. What does it say? Perluminous granites means nothing to me. So 
we not only will deal with Mike Eddy a fair amount, you'll get sick of the name so, soon enough. You may be sick of it already. Build a shrine to him in the classroom. And another one to Jeff Tepper, University of Puget Sound, who's been working with these Adekites in Western Washington. Build a shrine to him. Aaron Doughty, who's Mike's student. Very bright. She's wonderful. Build a shrine to her too. So it's those three guys, two guys and a gal, that we will be really learning a lot from. And it's Tepper that's going to help. He's at the end of the semester at UPS. I don't want to bug him so much right now. I might wait another week or two. But I need to learn more about the Adekites and his supervision of these students. But that promote that prompts me to remember what I wanted to do with you here. Uh, so you know the Adekites we've looked at already, Southeast Alaska, and then a few of those dots down here in Washington and, and Vancouver Island. By the way, they may got good notes from last time. What were the names of the Adekites that are known on Vancouver Island? I don't have them, but if you name them, I'll, I'll recognize them. Oh, you know what? You've got them here. The last, the last, uh, this thing here. Yes, the Flores. Yeah, whatever. See, I didn't know. How to... The near trench magmas that we discussed briefly last time on Vancouver Island, the clay quat, let's say it that way the Walker Creek, and the Flores. Sound familiar from your notes last time? Well, here they are again with a couple of others from Washington. So this is still Mike, bold colors. And he's grouping these igneous rocks, northern Silesia, that's Olympic Peninsula Silesia. Notice he's got the time, this is our time window, 60 to 40. And you can read as well as I. This is how I finally figured out where our Adekites are in western Washington. Mount Pilchuk, heard of it, had to Google it. What does that say? Washington Adekite Dykes near Bremerton. Rachel's boyfriend, Micah Kippel, might be watching right now. He works in Yellowstone Park, former student in this program. He sent me a photo of a dike of Adekite in the Bremerton Hills that he got curious about, and I guess leads field trips out there, public trips before, before the virus. So this is Micah. Thank you, Micah. And so near Bremerton, we all know where Bremerton is, I think, right? Uh, 48 to 45. So I'm not really seeing this age pattern that... Uh, Spencer was talking about, I got to say, he had 60 all the way up to 30, going from our neck of the woods all the way up to uh, Queen Charlotte Island, which is now Haida Gwaii. Uh, but nonetheless, there are some near trench magnets. Let me show you on a map where those are. Disjointed today for sure, but hopefully kind of fun. One never knows these things. Here's US 2 over Stevens Pass. Everett, Seattle. So I want to learn more. Home viewers might have a, a, a kernel of wisdom or two about these areas, just hiking wise or photos maybe. I've never been to either. Mount Pilchuk, Mount Persis, the Persis Volcanics, and then Micah Land, Bremerton Hills. According to Eddie's paper, or at least his diagram, those are some Adekites. Who cares? Why do we care about Adekites? Ryan? Oh, yeah, mantle plume or... Or spreading ridge, or a combo platter. 
but hot mantle coming to the surface, perhaps melting the oceanic slab underneath. So this is an emerging story. And we're kind of right back to where I didn't want to go today. Remember, I wanted to be nice and well-behaved today, and I didn't want to get into these conflicting models and everything else. But I can't hold it, man. I can't hold it. I'm trying to stay disciplined. So maybe by even Thursday of this week, with part two of this Peninsula talk, I'll have more to say about these three near-trench magmas in Washington. Uh, I want to do... I don't. I'm probably not going to get to the horseshoe today, but I wanted to do one more thing. Where is it? Here. Also had to teach myself this this morning, and you may be ahead of me on this. We're back to the Blue Mountain Sandstone in the last five minutes that I have with you today. MDA stamped all over this place with detrital zircons. What does detrital mean, first of all? Their zircon's a mineral, super fashionable to be studying zircons. I get it. Detrital, what does that mean? Anybody? Ryan? So it's, it's the same root word as like detritus, like decay. So there's zircons that form somewhere else, and then that's like a breaking out of the Holy God in heaven, what is going on here? You're right out of 101. How do you know that? Oh, you did said strat. Oh, you're not straight out of 101. Oh, I, I, no, you ruined it. You might, okay. You said that's the only thing he remembers from the whole class. Okay. Sorry, Bree. I had to look up MDA. Ryan's on it. This is my simple minded way to try to explain what maximum depositional age is. We'll see if this works for you. Sandstone, like the Blue Mountain unit, reporting an MDA, a maximum depositional age for that particular sandstone. What do we mean? Well, we know that a sandstone is made out of individual sand grains. We can deduce, can't we? that not all the sand grains are the same age. In other words, they're not all coming from the same mountain. There might be seven different cliffs with seven different ages of different kinds of bedrock that are all eroding, and rivers, let's say, are bringing those sand grains into an area. So that's not hard for us to say that the sandstone is made out of different kinds of sand. And therefore, we might have different ages of sand grains that are all sitting there together in this sandstone with me so far. This is my simple way of doing it. So instead of using colors and a handout, I just thought I'd do it quickly on the chalkboard before you showed up. So solid, striped, X, my little symbol for four different age ranges. No, four different ages of sand in our sandstone. In other words, this is the age of the bedrock. Look at this. This is Precambrian bedrock nearby that the river brought sand grains in. This is Cretaceous, and so on. What MDA says is we've got to take all these different ages of sand and find the youngest sand grains. I'm paraphrasing what Ryan just said beautifully. I wish you were mic'd up for that like you were reading out of a textbook, but you weren't. And saying that we can't have the sandstone be deposited until we get all of these sand-grained ages together. In other words, the oldest that this sandstone layer can be is the age of the youngest sand grains in the unit. Am I making sense to you? That's the maximum age that this sandstone can be by looking for the collection of the youngest sand grains in the area. It's almost like exotic terrain stuff. It's like, what's the age of the terrain bedrock? And then a different age is when did that terrain get added to North America? It's kind of like this too. These are the ages, the actual grains in the bedrock where they formed originally up in the mountains, let's say. And then there's a depositional age, which is not truly the age of the sand grains. I hope you're fine there. So to wrap it up, Mike's 
main thrust of the paper, no pun intended because there are thrust faults in the paper, is that that blue mountain sandstone is younger than Silesia, and therefore Silesia was formed out in the water and was brought in. Are you going to give me a minute? You're going to give me a minute? And then I promise I'm done. So here's the best way that I can... I haven't seen anybody else do this, and I totally forgot about it until last night. This is a book, a popular geology book by Dave Tucker. It's called Geology Underfoot in Western Washington. He's been up at Western Washington and Bellingham for a long time. And just with a couple, also bold colors from Dave, here's his horseshoe. Different colors, we can deal with it. Tim, you wanted to guess. I'm not going to take time, sorry. I was asking why is it just in western Washington that we have this far younger stuff that's indented into Silesia? And here Dave's uh, three diagrams to explain it. We used to have a well-behaved subduction zone. Silesia was looking just like western Oregon and, and northern California. But then western Washington started to get squeezed. Heads are nodding furiously in the room, the right way, the up and down way. And we taco this MFR. And then we behead it. Bryce, we're going to taco it, and then we're going to lop off the head of the taco and look inside. Why are we squeezing or tacoing these sediments? And so let's see itself. Clockwise, clockwise M and F in rotation. If this doesn't work for you, come up to look at these two, two pages afterwards. But I've never used this in 101, but to me now I'm realizing I should be teaching this. This is one of the most obvious reasons or the most obvious manifestations of clockwise rotation into a stable Canadian buttress. Thank you for coming. I love you. Part two, I don't know what it will be like, but that will be Thursday. I'll see. How many going to see again? I'm going to see how many tomorrow morning? Half of you. I'm losing a couple. I guess midterms are happening now. Well, it'll be a slightly smaller group than normal, but we'll have a good time. I'll see you out there at the time and place. Thanks for joining us. I do have time to do some live Q&A. But hang on to your questions. I want to see how much chocolate we got left and uh, deal with people as they walk out the door. Okay? We'll do some live Q&A in just a second. Thank you. Oh, we still got some. Oh, oh, yeah, please, Colton. Please do. Did everybody get at least one piece of chocolate? You got four over there? Ash, did you have some chocolate? Okay, good. All right. How are you guys doing? What what flavor did you have? I think it was like white chocolate with some coffee in it or something. Oh, that sounds good. Yeah. Well, you can help yourself to another one if you want. Yeah. Sure, please do. We good, everybody? Okay. Kind of. How long are you thinking the height is going to run, roughly? Like, kind of similar to the. Kind of like the others. It can be. Uh, this one is even more kind of uh, variable. Like, you can do it the way you want it. Like, okay. it, it could be an hour and go. It could be busting all the way to the top. Is it similar to the one like when we went to Kashmir and just hiked up to the top to get a nice overview and also get a good overlook of other things? Yes and no. Uh, we're going to meet in the parking lot and probably talk a little bit at the base. And then I'll probably walk with some people kind of along the base if people aren't that interested. I mean, some are going to bust to the top no matter what, and that's that's fine. But I'll probably like go up. Uh, it, it won't be an intense physical thing mm -hmm. generally, yeah. okay. but it can be if people are itching to, you know, get a little exercise. Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah, but that Discover Pass, we need that Discover Pass. Okay. I have a poster to get together for AEG still. So okay, I'll... good. Hi. How... This is really stressing me out because of the classes. I don't, how is the midterm going to go? Like, how is it? Because, like, I'm not.
everything's been kind of like, oh, well, we're going to do it this way. And then we add new things. And so now I'm like yeah. super stressed about the new question. Well, I don't want you to be super stressed. You saw my email and kind of described the style of the questions. Did you? No. Oh, okay. Well, that's a, that's a first step. So I sent an email. What was it? Sunday night, maybe? Yeah, was it Sunday, Ray? Why don't you read that? That okay. should make you feel better. I have okay. some very specific advice on how how I will be asking questions and what I'm expecting you. Okay. But please. I, I, I must have missed it. I do get quite a few emails from. Mm -hmm. I'm sure. Anywhere, so must have look, look for that. and That will make you feel better, I think. Okay. And then you and I can just sit out in the sun and talk a little more if, if you're still feeling uppity and we can, uh, we can get a, a decent strategy for you. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Yep, you bet. Hey, you know, we can always do a study group too and compare that. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. I was actually going to see if you guys want to do that tomorrow. Okay. So. Sure. Yeah. Regarding Mount Pilchuck. That's my mountain. It's my favorite place in the Mount world. Mount Pilchuck is your mountain. My mountain. I've been there. I can't even tell you how many okay. times. I grew up going there. What town did you grow up in? Uh, Everett. Everett, okay. My, my parents live in Marysville now. Okay. And Mount Pilchuck is near Granite Falls, and it's a place called Verlot. Okay. That's where I go at least. Nice. It's only about 30 minutes away from my house. Okay. Um, I have this interesting specimen that I found at a place called Gothic Basin okay. on Mount Pilchuck. Yeah. And I don't know what it is. Uh huh. And I've, I've chucked this thing at the street like 50 times. It's great. <laughs> The outer layer will break, and I have a piece of it. Okay. But the inside, it, it, it's almost like compacted ash. It's super Well, big. you know, if it's if, if you want to bring it in next time you're home, uh, I'd be happy to take a peek, maybe even share it with the audience. Oh, you do? Okay. I was wondering if I could bring it in, and if there's Please a do. way that I could possibly use one of the cutting machines here to cut it open. Chris would be the guy to talk to about that. But, yeah, we can, we can arrange uh, that. Time? Yeah, uh-huh. Okay. Um, it's really weird. I'd like to bring it in to show you because I've never seen anything like sure. that before. And well, that's the only thing I know so far. Those rocks are weird. Yeah. So we can decide if it's truly part of the Adekite story or if it's something well, else. That's another thing. Uh -huh. I believe I have a piece of Adekite okay. that I found like a year ago on a hike. You could tell me anything. Uh, I wouldn't even know what an Adekite looks like if you hold it in front of my hands. I looked it up because I've been curious about this rock that I have. And yeah. I, I looked it up and I think it might be Okay. So okay. I can always bring that in for you. Well, please do, and I'll, I'll try to bug uh, Jeff Tepper before Thursday and see if I can have just a little bit more chambered so that I can say something intelligent about those because they're becoming a pretty big part of our story, I think. Um, well, there, that was another thing. Yeah. If you would like, next time I go home, sure. I, I always go hiking up there. Okay. I would be willing to bring back some, some rocks for you. Well, thank if you. If you'd like to have them for your own purposes or for teaching, I, I can totally get you some rocks from up there. That's my mountain. So. Well, thank you. Um, I, uh, why don't you check in with me before you go home next time, and I'll I'll see if I have a need. This might I don't have a sense of how big how how featured this will be in our course. If it is, that would be helpful to have some samples. Okay. That sounds good. Thanks, Ree. All right. Let's do some Q and A. Uppercase, please, and I'll try my best. Nick, has anyone tra uh, tracked backward to find where the zircons were formed? There's plenty of that work being done, especially to either support or the opposite of Baja BC. And quite often the zircons that are Precambrian in age, which is more than a thousand million years old, um, that's part of the exotic terrain series I was doing last fall, but it, it ultimately is saying we've, we have some zircons in the exotic terrains and did the zircon grains come from Precambrian rock down in the Mojave Desert of Southern California or in the Lemhi Mountains of Central Idaho? And there's arguments for and against that. If that's what you're talking about with detrital zircons, that's one story. But as we'll see as the weeks go on, Aaron... I even asked Erin how to pronounce her last name. Donaghy, I guess, or Donaghy. I'll have to recheck that text. But Erin is getting zircons in the chumstick um, right out of uh, volcanic tufts. So right here, we're talking about zircons that have been you know, rolled down a river. But there are other zircons that are shaped differently that are, are truly formed during a volcanic event. And again, these zircons are yielding these uh, 
very impressive, accurate uh, new dates. That's why it's, it's exciting to follow uh, the work of Mike Eddy and Jeff Tepper and, and Aaron Donahue. Uh, Papa Gino, don't we have dates for all the geologic structures yet? Probably not. I'm not sure what you mean by geologic structures, but um, as you've kind of picked up on in this class, uh, dates that were well known and beloved 30 years ago are rarely the dates that we have now, simply because the, the technology, the tools, the sampling uh, has improved so much. And this, this zircon analysis has really upped the game of precision makes you wonder what's coming next, you know? 30, 40 years from now, will they say, oh yeah, that zircon thing, they, they, you know, they, they had such crazy large error bars. Now we can date it down to, uh, this happened between Tuesday and, and the following Wednesday. <laughs> I don't know. Ryan, you want to ask something? Okay. Yeah, uh, give me, if you want to come back in about 15 minutes, I'll be in my office. Okay, great. Thanks. All right. Michael, how do we explain, how do the Baja BC advocates explain that the age progression of the NTMs in Alaska is backwards from, for a northward propagating triple junction? Backwards of a northward propagating triple junction. I'll try right now, Michael. The, uh, as I understand it, Daryl Cowan and John Garver, for instance, who are major Baja BC people, as I understand it, they're not migrating that triple junction a whole lot. So at least from my mind, they're holding the triple junction steady and then they're, they're uh, moving, moving the Chugash terrain. Now I kind of see what you're asking in the middle of my answer. I think the answer is the northward migration is not fast enough. The rate of migration of the triple junction is not fast enough to um, affect the age progression of the near trench magmas in Alaska. I have a furrowed brow because I'm not sure that I even know what I'm talking about at the moment. I'll, I'll put, give more thought to that. Thank you. I can't hold it. Mike Eddy is the only guy that I'm aware of, Baja BC or not, that actually, this is a secret, but I'll share it with the class in a week or two, who actually sees a southward migration of the triple junction for a time, and then it moves north again. And he's got a whole different collection of field data from central Washington to, uh, to land on that interpretation. So you'll have to stay tuned. Charlie, can we mention the Yellowstone hotspot? Yeah, we'll get back to it. As I've said in previous live streams, I, I can't do everything at once. And um, the mantle plume is not a, the mantle plume is responsible for the lower crescent and the upper crescent in today's lecture, Celestia, but otherwise is not a big player in what we were looking at briefly today. I don't really know what I'm doing on Thursday but it's, I guess it's still Olympic Peninsula, so I'll figure something out. Marbles Collector, what was the scene west of Celestia 49 million years ago when it was done being accreted? That's what, that's what we will do. So in addition, there was a lot in that Blue Mountain paper, which is in the link below. Also in the link below is... Uh, a couple of interviews with Mike Eddy, one shot just last summer and one shot back when he was a grad student at, at MIT. So you can get introduced to Mike that way. Uh, in the second half of that Blue Mountain paper, Mike's kind of putting the timing of things together. And he has images that talks about what we can visualize west of Celestia post accretion. And the short answer is a bunch of blue mountain turbidites. But I'll, I'll, I'll take that step with everybody on Thursday. Thank you. Rachel, are you still on the road, Rachel? 
How might Marley's handbook match with Mike's work? So you must be talking about Marley Miller's uh, second edition of Roadside Geology, co-authored by Daryl Cowan. So I'm still kind of working this out, but I, I don't know if Mike Eddy is, I don't know where he stands on Baja BC. And in the scope of what we're talking about here, 40 to 60 to 40 million years ago, I don't think it matters a whole lot. But maybe it does now that I think about it. Uh, so I don't know. I haven't thought about that. Thank you. Canadian entropy is the Re Leech River complex an accretionary wedge between Solezzi and Rangelia. I'll express my ignorance here. Uh, I think the Leech River is a fault. And I wouldn't view it as a complex. Did this autofocus work today? Is it is it helpful to have the autofocus turned on? I guess I'll see once I look at the replay. I just have to hold it there a little bit longer. The LRF is the Leech River Fault, which separates pink is uh, pillowed Celestia, and this stuff is Rangelia, which is a different. You know what? This is this is a a large igneous province that accreted 50 million years ago. This is a large igneous province that accreted 100 million years ago. It's called Rangelia, and the Leech River Fault is the structural boundary between those two. So that's how I view the Leech River Fault. And if it's more of a complex, then I, I don't understand that part of the story. Thank you. Ronnie, how did the sandstone zircons give the age of the sandstone? I tried to explain that here, Ronnie. Uh, I don't know how effective it was for you, but there's different generations of sand with different ages, just like different generations of people at a picnic. Oh, that might work. And you can't have the picnic. You get the age of the babies at the picnic. You can't have the picnic. If we have all these four generations of people at the picnic, babies, teenagers, middle-aged people, and old people, they're all at the picnic. When do you put the picnic blanket down? You got to put the picnic blanket down after the babies are born. Might keep that one. I think that worked. John, Mr. Spreading Ridge, Nash. Did the Washington near trench magmas get rotated? If so, from approximately where? Good, good question, John. I will think about it. My short answer, my immediate answer is no. We're too far north. Hang on, Patrick. Hang on, John. I guess I don't have my clockwise thing. Uh, you know, the clockwise rotation is, is uh, crazy. Fast, crazy fast rotation out here when you crack the whip you're way out in the end of the whip and you're you're flying on the ice rink uh, but as we've said multiple times that rotation is is slowing and then stopping uh, once we get into Vancouver Island country so if we're asking about the near trench magmas on Vancouver Island and western Washington uh, I can double check that but I I think we have little little to no rotation Thanks for the question. As always, I look forward to be proven wrong, sometimes in real time. <laughs> uh, down to live, because I lost my place, automatic scroll. Geofire, regarding the age spread of the northern uh, near-trench magmas, has a north-south oriented 
spreading ridge been ruled out, a north-south spreading ridge. I don't know if it's been ruled out, but I'm not sure why you would want that north-south ridge. Don't we have to have, I mean, S K S K R B. we're going from 61 down to 47. This stuff isn't all the same age. So I don't know why a north-south spreading ridge intersecting the coastline would help us here. And I think why these, this is one of the many reasons I think these guys want a spreading ridge that's almost east-west, more northeast-southwest. And then we move the green bean north to get that age progression. I think I got your question there. These are all excellent questions. I'm always very impressed with the level of commitment and the level of thinking that we have here. Kevin, uh, would a spreading ridge cause the clockwise rotation? The way that we will continue to talk and the way that Mike Eddy continues to talk is that the spreading ridge position is very crucial in understanding what portions of North America are moving north on strike-slip faults. This is, this is stealing some thunder from basically the next couple of weeks. But I don't think Mike's talking about clockwise rotation. So the clockwise rotation that is very popular with many of us is not viewed as being driven by one spreading ridge. BC Outdoorsman. Please explain, expand, clarify, define NAP. Yeah, I don't remember. Some kind of structural thrust fault thing. Um, I don't use jargon unless I have to. Ghost PC, was Celestia formed like Iceland? I think so. I still really haven't been able to find a good source to compare the volume of basalt in the entire Iceland large igneous province, if it is a large igneous province, compared to the original volume of the basalt in Silesia. I'd feel better if I really found a, a, a quantifiable way to compare Iceland the mound of basalt on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge called Iceland. I'm not just talking about what's above water, of course, compared to the original volume of the basalts on Silesia. That must exist somewhere. Well, I think it is a good modern analogy, uh, but I, I haven't, I haven't uh, closed the deal on that. Scrolling back now. Can all these mysteries be solved by Christmas? Sure. I'll put that on my list. Patrick, age seven. Hi, Patrick. How much time do you spend studying research articles? Do you have favorite researchers you always think about? Well, Patrick, I like learning new things, and I know that you like learning new things too. You're age seven, I'm age 58, but we both have that in common. We like to learn new things. I think I mentioned at some point that in my first hour of every day, I'm freshest and I like to feel productive. So I read something every morning when I have some coffee. And I just don't read random things. I usually pick a theme like we're doing this class. And then I, I try to read different scientific papers on that theme. And you know, by now I've, I've gotten to know many of the researchers, mostly by email, but sometimes in person. And so, yeah, they become my favorites because I like the way they write a paper, Patrick, or I like their uh, diagrams, or I, I like how simply they write, or, um, or it's just an area that's interesting to me, you know. You'll notice, Patrick, that I'm not talking about Arizona or Colorado or Florida or Bavaria. Uh, there's plenty to learn about and think about right here in Washington or the Pacific Northwest. 
So when I'm asked to, if I would be interested in doing a program on the Rocky Mountains or the Black Hills or the Ozarks, I say, thanks for asking, but no, I, I, I want to stay here. So therefore, I'm just reading work done here in the Pacific Northwest. But, you know, I'm a slow thinker, Patrick. It takes me a long time to really understand things. And um, it takes me a long time to decide how I want to uh, present information. But I think I am good at one thing, Patrick, and that is taking all, this, all these words and finding a way to tell a story. And what I'm doing in this class is a little bit chaotic because it's the first time I've tried it. Uh, in other words, I just read something yesterday and I'm trying to teach it in the classroom. But um, I think I can organize big ideas and small ideas in a way that, that works for a lot of different kinds of people. Like seven-year-olds, like you. But you're not really like most seven-year-olds, Patrick. Two more and we're done. Let's go down to live. Got to go talk to Patrick. No, I got to go talk to Ryan, <laughs> who's probably 22. Glenn, could Celestia compare to the Deccan traps in India? That's a pretty big chunk of basalt. It could, for sure. And I think our our friend Mike Eddy has worked on uh, those India flood basalts as well, using his high-precision dating tools. Uh, could Celestia compare? Sure. What's the comparison? I don't know. I haven't taken the time to do it. B partly because of what I just said. I like to stay close to home, unless there's a reason to go other places globally to help us understand what's, what's close to home. Let me find one to end on here. Oh, we'll, fin we'll finish with an easy one. Thanks, Kyle. When will my field work with Mike Eddy start? Uh, I just got an email this morning from Mike. That's why he, he thought maybe he would tune in here. He was happy to hear that we were talking about some of this stuff in a classroom. Um, Sounds like late July, Mike's team will be in the North Cascades. And I'm going to be visiting my mother <laughs> the last weekend in July, so that's right in the middle of it. But I, I think the tentative plan is that last week in July, I'm going to hook up with Mike and Stacia Gordon and Bob Miller. I assume they'll all be together uh, somewhere, camping somewhere or whatever. And I'll be uh, doing some interviews. And hopefully... We'll by the end of this class, we'll have enough background to make sense of their plan. And uh, so that's the tentative thought. July of this year, just hang out with those guys for two, three days maybe, and uh, meet everybody. I've only met Mike once, and uh, that's part of the video that's linked down below. Last comment, I continue to get way more emails than I can reply to. I know that sounds hoity-toity, but I'm just, I just feel like I feel, I feel like I need to say it every once in a while because I feel really rotten that I can't reply to every email. But if you've been sending me all sorts of stuff and I'm not replying, I'm reading all of your emails. I really am. And occasionally I'm replying if it's something super helpful to me. But if you're not hearing from me, I'm reading that email. I just, I just don't have the time. So I hope you can understand. A toast to you. Sorry, Patrick. Apparently, Janet has more of these that she can send to you with a self-addressed stamped envelope. And you can find Janet on Facebook at the, uh, what's it called? Fans of Nick Zentner Facebook page. So you can get your own sticker. Here's a toast to your health. Here's a toast to your health of your community and the health of your, all of your loved ones near and far.
And here's to everyone continuing to work remotely or in person. It was a big announcement that everybody was coming back to work in person this June. And some of us wanted to say, hey, man, some of us have been here for the last year. I don't know about you guys. Okay, I think that's enough for today. I appreciate you joining us. Uh, I won't post tomorrow's field trip video until this weekend, uh, but I'll come up with uh, Olympic Peninsula Part 2 on Thursday at 1 p.m. Hope you can join us. Thank you. I love you. And goodbye. <laughs>